Hi, this is Bob Scully, and welcome to another edition of The World Show, Entrepreneurs, the Dobson Series. This week, we're going to meet two entrepreneurs who are locksmiths. Now, there's an old and honorable profession, except, get this, they are digital locksmiths. As a matter of fact, that's the name of the company, Digital Locksmiths. And one of them is a certified ethical hacker. The word ethical is important, of course. He can hack into all kinds of things. He knows how it's done, but he does it for the good guys, not the bad guys. Here, then, is Terry Cutler and his partner, CEO Wadi Tanous. Terry Cutler, Wadi Tanous, I've always wanted to meet a certified ethical hacker, um, next best thing to a real evil hacker. Um, but what is a certified ethical hacker? So the, the way a hacker, certified ethical hacker works is, you know, back in the day, uh, I got influenced by watching shows like CSI and 24, and I'm wondering, how's Chloe and Brian breaking all these systems so fast? So I did some research, and there was actually a course called The Certified Ethical Hacker, where they teach you the same techniques the bad guys use to break in, except using those skills for good to defend corporations and individuals. And you and you down in Washington D.C. Yeah, it was in Washington. I actually got the privilege to train with the FBI and CIA and Navy SEALs who were actually in that in that course with me. So we got to share uh, an abundance of wealth of information. And yet, a question that occurs to anybody listening to this uh, is: Okay, so they teach you the the stuff the bad guys do for good, but why are the bad guys still around doing it? Why why, why aren't why haven't we shut down these methods and these, these loopholes? Well, it's part of uh, the human nature is to take up the challenges. I mean, most hackers, I mean, majority of hackers, the way it started, it's just basically a challenge that they wanted to take up that I broke into this particular system. However, as the, our life has evolved and the economies and the countries have evolved, now it became a lucrative business. Mm -hmm. So, and especially with the breakdown of the USSR and a lot of the scientists have been out of uh, their particular job uh, responsibilities, now they became like free agents and they can use those skills to either for industrial espionage or uh, national security uh, threats uh, or just for economical benefits. Yeah. But are they always one step ahead? They are, because a lot of times, you know, us as professionals, we go home, we have a family at night, uh, we have a job, and these guys can just specialize in those domains all day long. And when you get a bunch of these specialists together, that's when uh, the, the danger happens. So you're not surprised when, when, when we read, for instance, this is said, it's not proven, but that the Chinese are able to wreak havoc and they use, they use officially private citizens and call them hackers and say, that's not us. Right. But actually the government is directing them to wreak havoc around the planet. That's plausible. Yeah, but you know, I always have a concern with that because a lot of these, these hackers go through what's called anonymizers. So I could be sitting in Montreal and go to an anonymizer which comes out of China and then right back into Canada mm -hmm. and perform an attack and they'll say, oh, the attacks came from China for sure because they have no jurisdiction to go in there and, and confiscate the servers. And most of the times the logs will be erased. So it's like, it's like breaking into a house and then sweeping out, sweeping up uh, for yourself as you leave. But, but yes. However, however, if I may add, there is a validity to this because as we are now more and more into going from the information age into more of the online virtualization and the e-commerce and so on, there are valuable ways for countries now to create defenses or threats to other countries via the online. So the, the, there is a plausible, plausible scenario that certain countries will go on to the online um, hacking business to, uh, you know, to advance certain uh, political or economical or wreck havoc. You know, well, one spectacular on the... example seems to have been the Israelis. They barely denied it. They've really given lip service to the denial that they may have interfered with the Iranian nuclear program from afar just by getting into those computers. Yeah. That's a very good point because, uh, you know, if we hear a lot about cyber terrorism. And a lot of incidents that we're hearing about uh, when someone hacks into a company or some steals credit cards, about uh, they call it cyber terrorism. But actually, in actuality, the definition of cyber terrorism is when you are using those hacking methods to uh, interrupt, mm -hmm. uh, you know, infrastructure that are uh, critical to our day-to-day, -day, you know, operation, mm -hmm. such as the electrical grid or uh, you know, uh, nuclear. Uh, power plant, etc. Yes, so this is uh, this is a very uh, it's a shift. Actually. It's actually though it's it's odd because it's for good, quote unquote. Since they're That's trying correct. to stop yeah. people from making a bomb. That's yeah. correct. But that That's was correct. that was a dangerous that was a dangerous example because the the turbines were were, were overheating, but the monitoring systems were still were still saying it was okay. Ah, so, so they could have caused a absolutely, all right, absolutely. 
Now, when you say when you, you, you took the course, sir, how long is that course? It takes it lasts about a week, week and a half. That's all? Yep, but it's intensive, so you're there for 11, 12 hour days. And you going in there were a computer Yes, whiz, you, have, you, you have, have to have some background in computers. So and, been, and so now, even though you're <coughs> duty bound to do this for good, yep. again, uh, quote unquote, um, supposing I asked you as, as a challenge, all right, get into the Royal Bank of Scotland. Right. Get into their systems right now. Could you do it? Well, first thing, we always ask for authorization first. So without the authorization, we can't, we can't even turn on the computer. So if, if we did have the authorization to do it, because maybe you had the contacts there, we had all everything mm -hmm. signed and everything, then, yeah, we can just, we have a bunch you of You can go in. We can go in, yeah. So they're not... we test. I mean, not every system is breakable. So but most are. Most are. Because you know where the weakest link is? Where? It's actually the humans, the end, the end users. So as an example, let's say I was to break into this bank. I wouldn't necessarily have to go after the firewall systems. I would find out who works at the bank and send them an email saying, here's the documents you requested from the Britain office. Uh -huh. And they're going to go click that link, and they're going to install a virus that will let me right into the back door and bypass all your expensive million-dollar system. And no virus detector, permanent virus detector, can automatically de find that. Absolutely not. I why mean, not, though? When you think of it, why not? Well, I mean, we have to look at the human nature itself. Uh, we are systems that are geared and programmed to be trustworthy. And you cannot basically create and mimic that type of uh, understanding on when to stop the viruses or how to stop all the various scenarios of those viruses. For example, the social engineering example that Terry had, uh, you know, had mentioned, mm -hmm. it, ha it has to do, bottom line, with the trust factor. I'm trusting that person, that email address that is coming from my Britain office. I'm trusting that document. I'll open it. You know, now I have a back door. Just by virtue of opening just it. Just virtue yeah. or, you know, of opening it. Uh, other ways of uh, uh, methods that can be used is very simple. You walk into, after a bunch of employees, into a particular corporation, you know, and people will keep the door ajar for you to come in without seeing your ID. You ask for, let's say, if you used to use their uh, public bathroom. You go in, you put a couple of USB keys on the wash, uh, you know, um, on the on the uh, faucet, you know, the, the yeah, faucet. Yeah, on the sink. On the sink, and you walk out. Somebody will plug it in. Someone time. will pick it up. Oh, really? And plug it that's in. That's how we usually. That's how yeah, we. Because they're it. curious. Yes. Yeah. It's and that will picks. put malware into the. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because a lot of it stays in memory. So unless it's written to the actual hard drive, the, the antivirus won't kick in and say, "Hey, this is malicious." But an, what is the point of an antivirus at all then? Right now, they're 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 becoming less and less efficient because now, with, as the news happened with Symantec uh, being broken into, the source code for antivirus and some other software was taken. So eventually, once it gets broke, once it gets decoded, the antiviruses will almost become useless. And how about encryption? Good old-fashioned encryption. For instance, on the BlackBerry, the degree of encryption is pretty high. Yep. Is that of any use? It, it, has, it has its own purpose when it was created. However, the technology and the use of these devices has evolved, okay? But unfortunately, the encryption devices has not been, you know, catching up to that. Uh, encryption mainly is you're scrambling the data, and then at one end, you know, you have a descrambler, and the other end has the, you know, has mm -hmm. the same descrambler. Yeah. So when you send this data, it opens up. At the end, you know, at, at the end, when you are not careful with how to use the device that whatever malware or virus are sitting now inside your device mm -hmm. and it's looking at all kinds even the encryption capability that you have so it can ride with the encryption and then goes to the other end it decrypted and then now we are inside boy that's scary uh, it's scary to talk to you guys but looking at your entrepreneurial story how then do you pick up clients if any client is to ask you quiz you the way I've just quizzed you and you confirm with him that nothing is perfectly safe, why would he want to use you? Sign here. <laughs> so, yeah, we show him. Uh, a lot of times we'll talk about some of the stories we've done. And, but that's the, one of the challenges we have is that customers say, oh, no, we're safe, we don't need security. And then, you know, months later, they end up on a 6 o'clock news. And but, 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 but worse than that is if you, if they ask you, can you protect me totally, you can't even say yes. No, you can't. And we won't. No. Because there is no total security that exists. Mm. However, our approach to it is a holistic approach. We look at every single aspect that touches the environment. Humans, infrastructure, 
IT systems, even HR policies, even at, you know, uh, uh, to the point of partners, uh, uh, contractors, subcontractors. So we look at that from a holistic way, mm -hmm. and then we are able to identify and prioritize the threat areas. You don't have to come in, and, and everybody who says that you, I can protect you and guarantee 100% security is unfortunately not telling you know the, 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 the true whole story, truth, yeah. the whole truth. Uh, another, another thing too, we have to uh, uh, look at the fact that with the new generation of workers that are coming into the you know into this mm -hmm. you know the mainstream line, mm -hmm. which is the Generation Y, they're very productive, very choosy about where to work. However, they're very socially connected. So they have to really the, understand what are the responsibilities and the consequences when they are now a professional you know, worker and understanding where the, what the trade secrets they have to protect and what they have to behave and how they, sorry, how they want to behave mm -hmm. within an environment itself. So it's a responsibility and it's two phases, awareness and governance. That's what it comes, up, it comes down to. But is there at least, how shall we say, a mid-level of security that can be attained? Yes. If you come in, I noticed in one of the, in, in one in your literature, uh, you were treating a case where you found malware. It uh, sounds almost like uh, like uh, mining, thirty thousand pages down. Yes. In a website. Yeah. You found a bug. Yeah. Um, but you had to do a lot of searching. Absolutely. So we have a lot of tools that help us. Um, data mine all this stuff as well but we, we have to have great testers to actually understand this code and review it manually so luckily we had some great testers to uh, to get that job done and then you also sometimes submit to an exam you have a tester independent of yourself yep come in to try and challenge what you've done that's right Absolutely. yep and if he fails then you're happy because that's right and and i remember speaking once to a a, a great uh, specialist who, who, and again, I was kind of frustrated saying, well, why, why in the world isn't this thing cleaned up once and for all? And he said, you could, but the Internet grew like a, like a patchwork quilt in bits and pieces, erratically. Nobody thought it would explode like that. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to be able to shut it down like a hotel that you refurbish, where you change the wiring and so on. Right. If you could shut it down for six months, you probably could make it secure. Is that true? Well, it is true, but it cannot happen. No, I know. He said that too. He said it's just too, too essential to everybody. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's why uh, you know there is a mention about a second generation or third generation internet that is being you know built uh, you know right now for specific purposes uh, such as uh, you know a critical infrastructure, you know government business, etc. That will alleviate you know the concerns and the risks from the original internet. You know, and so it's not a rumor. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, well, I mean, it is not a rumor. It is. It is a uh, an ongoing effort and more government it, effort. I assume. I believe so. Yes. And and but when that is complete, there will be a parallel system. Yes. And that will be uncrackable. Well, <laughs> there's still the human element yeah. in there. I wouldn't say we are not perfect in you know systems, and as long as humans are involved uh, as part of the design, the architecture, and the use of uh, an environment, as there are always going to be you know uh, holes in that uh, that you a, can crack. We have a saying that there's no fix for human stupidity. <laughs> Yes, no, and, and I know that when people, um, uh, very often the, the banking systems are pretty good, the banks have pretty good firewalls, yeah. but the minute you go with your debit card to a grocery store yeah. and you put it in, or your credit card, and you put your PIN number in, yeah. anybody c who can pick up on wireless is sitting in the parking lot has right. you. Yeah. So that has nothing to do with the bank, it's you. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. We even had some of our specialists go in, you can have technology where you can have a, an antenna which will go out and, and send out a signal to everybody. So anybody who's got the chip card will be able to pull off the information out of it. Really? Right. In a given, like in a store, in a range? That's right, within a range, yep. Yeah. So is this a hopeless situation? No, it's not. Um, it's actually a work, you know, there is a workable solution. It's going to take a long time, you know. However, with the proper um, awareness campaigns and the proper governance that is in place, everyone has to be has to act responsibly you know, whenever they're using the internet. Uh, again, I gave the example earlier about the Generation Y. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a lot of the teen our teenagers now, they are living more and more reliant on the devices. They're sharing amount of information, yes, tremendous absolutely. amount of information about themselves, about their families, about what they're doing. Unfortunately, this information cannot, it's not going away. Mm -hmm. Whenever they are in, at an age where they're going to have to take responsibility of becoming into 
uh, the workplace, this information can be retrieved and could become an issue, you know, for either employment. Even not, it's just threatening to the family members, other family members. I mean, I'll give you an example. Just a simple picture that you take on your phone. You upload it into a Facebook or my whatever, mm -hmm. my space and so on. That picture has geo information, Geotech. geolocation yeah. information ah. that identifies where it was taken from. And if you use the proper, uh, you know, tools in there, you can exactly pinpoint, pinpoint where a child might be or something might, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Where it was taken. And, and when you're in front of a client, um, we, you discuss in your literature some of the, let's look again at the entrepreneurial story, your, your business model is uh, retainers with corporations um, or, or one-shot operations, salvage operations, protection operations. What kind of client do you look for and how do you service them? We, uh, we have uh, a select, you know, select customer list that we go after. I mean, that really are in specific areas or environments or industries that we work with. We have a lot of strategic partners that have other customers too that they will, uh, you know, bring us in for our mm -hmm. services. There's two sides for our services. One is what we call the feasibility services, which really understand and study the holistic way of the environment. Because before you you uh, you, you know how to clean it up, you have to understand where you are. And, you know, and uh, with the issue now, the days that corporations are dealing with is that uh, on the privacy issue, mm -hmm. that any breach of the privacy, the board of directors, you know, the members of the board of directors are personally liable. So they're not, they don't have that kind of indemnification capability any, any longer. So you have to really understand what are the priorities uh, as part of our feasibility services that we provide. Then from there we have the product side of the, you know, of the, bu of the business, which basically uh, handle the, you know, the, the privacy and the security of mobile devices and any devices that are being used as part of the operational. Right. And so when you leave the client's offices after having done this, which might take typically what? few weeks or uh, the feasibility services ranges between maybe uh, two weeks to uh, month mm -hmm. you know type uh, time frame uh, you know from a to really study and understand because we focus only on the areas that are risk averse. And, and so when you leave you have pretty much cleaned it up and you've given them uh, instructions on how to keep it clean yeah, we, we, we pretty much collected everything we felt is a, is, a, is at risk document it so that either the customer could do it themselves or we can and and do you stay you on a retainer basis with them? Do you come in every now and then to sort of... It's starting to. A lot of times these, these, these corporations don't have budgets, mm -hmm. which is one of the problems we have. So a lot of times we'll go in there and you know, we'll just hack right through them, pull out all kinds of credit card data, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh. Hmm. Or then all of a sudden you didn't know you were held liable? Oh, geez. You should have downloaded it from the privacy law. So and this is one of the challenges in, in being in business. Unfortunately, security has has always been considered a cost center, mm -hmm. uh, not a profit center within corporations. So the budget they they are the last one to get any budget or no budget at all. Uh, but if they all. open the paper, they can see that yes. it can now, end up being yes. a cost yes. problem too. Yeah. Now it's being market. prioritized. There's another case study on on our website where uh, the, comp uh, the corporation got breached the year before and brought in a large company, so it cost them like $150,000 to get it cleaned up, mm -hmm. where if they would have done a test properly the year before, it would have cost them maybe $10,000 or $20,000. That's $20, incredible. Yeah. So. And, and um, is it true that uh, with the so-called botnets, what they use for denial of service, that people might have computers in their offices or their homes, they have yep. no idea that when there's an attack like that with 10,000 computers, their computer is one of them. Yep. They have no idea. So that's what happened on the other case study. You'll see one from uh, CompuWeez where their website all of a sudden just was unreachable because someone uh, launched a botnet, a denial of service attack against their, their website. Mm -hmm. So we had to move them off a different provider to one that had this capability for defense. And, and, and uh, again, getting back to the entrepreneurial story, this is obviously a necessary business yeah. and a thriving business. Now, can it be a lucrative business? Do you expect your firm to be 10 times as big in a few years? Yes, of course. Probably, right? Because yeah. The need is immense. Yeah. The, need, the need is immense, and it's all about, uh, uh, as we are growing more and more uh, and using these sophisticated devices, uh, devices and especially integrated devices from at-home entertainment cent you know, centers that are now surfing the Internet, you mm -hmm. don't have even to move from your couch mm -hmm. anymore. Right. And that's the, that's the convenience of it. However, there's an exposure there that would constitute a you know, major threat and a good market for us. Yeah. We have an aggressive agenda. Within 10 years, we'd like to be a blueprint company. 
which is a billion dollar firm, but obviously mm. we can't do it alone. So we have strategic partners that we work with. So every partner, what's, what's unique about these folks is that every partner has a specialty that the other one doesn't. So when you, when you have five or six groups like that, um, and you, you bring a holistic approach to the customer, so you bring them one big picture solution. So now you, they can say, okay. And you would trust. service, you'd be a billion dollar company servicing billion dollar clients, obviously. Absolutely. I assume. Right. Well, well, Terry Cutler and, and uh, Wadi Tanus, I, I wish it upon both of you. And um, there's a few people I'd like to hack, and uh, maybe <laughs> maybe I can get you to change your mind. If they the authorize yeah, 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 exactly. No, 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 they wouldn't. They wouldn't, they wouldn't. Thank you so much. Good, Thank good, good luck and long life. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.